Welcome, everyone, to this briefing brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, our name is Abit Chonistim. IDSF is the leading Israeli organization advocating for strong national security-oriented policies to guide the state of Israel. We are a movement of more than 20,000 people, including many reserve officers and operators from all branches of the Israel Defense Establishment. Thank you to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning into these briefings. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Mordechai Kedar, who served in the IDF military intelligence for 25 years, specializing in Arab political discourse, Arab mass media, Islamic groups, and the Syrian domestic arena. Dr. Kedar teaches in the Department of Arabic at Bar Ilan University and is a research associate at the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies, and of course, is a member of IDSF. Dr. Kedar, thank you so much for joining me today. It's my pleasure and honor, Moshe. We have a very important issue to discuss, as you mentioned uh, before we began, um, which is the pro-Iranian militias gathering in Iraq. Can you please share with our viewers uh, what is happening on that front? Well, we hear once in a, once in a while that the Americans are bombing and shelling uh, uh, bases which are used by these militias the, in, in Iraq in Syria as well, because in Iraq there are like 50, 5 zero, um, pro-Iranian militias. In Syria, by the way, there are like 17 of them, uh, thousands of people uh, ready to, you know, to, to, uh, to join a war against Israel. And there is a possibility, uh, at least uh, a theoretic possibility, that uh, these militias in Iraq, and maybe in Syria as well, will uh, try to go through Jordan, to pass through Jordan, in order to reach the Israeli border with Jordan, which is all the way, all the way from the north, uh, near the Kinneret, uh, in, in the north, all the way down to Elat. It's uh, more than 200 kilometers, 300 kilometers. And, uh, 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 and they might uh, be willing to invade Israel uh, in dozens of places, just like what Hamas did in Gaza in the morning of the October 7th. And this is a possibility which Israel should bear in mind, should be prepared for um, in order to block it uh, in, in, on, on its way before they come to the Israeli borders. And the same thing, by the way, can happen in, in the Golan uh, borders uh, because there are like 17 um, pro-Iranian militias in Syria who might uh, plan the same thing in the Golan and in, to invade the Golan and occupy uh, Katsrin and the Israeli uh, places in, in the Golan. So uh, we, uh, uh, as long as we are dealing with Gaza and with Lebanon, we should not forget the uh, potential problems which are in uh, Syria and Iraq. Now, let me ask you, if these pro-Iranian militias were to move aggressively in Jordan in order to reach the Israel border, is that something that the IDF would detect months, weeks, days in advance? Or that would be kind of covert and we could get stuck at the last minute on the border? Look, it all depends on intelligence. If the intelligence is aware of it and they might allocate intelligence devices in order to find this uh, or the preparations for this uh, action, uh, Israel might detect it uh, time in ahead. If, uh, if Israel does not uh, pay attention because Israel is too, too much occupied with uh, Gaza or with Lebanon and Israel neglects the uh, problems or the militias in Iraq and or Syria, they, they might surprise us again, as Hamas did on October 7th. What is the state of deterrence on the Jordanian border? I mean, ha is the IDF putting troops over there? Is there an escalated level of, of concern? Or is this something that you're bringing up and the government is not uh, worried about this? The border with Jordan is viewed as a peace border with a peaceful country which has relations with Israel, they have embassy here and we have embassy there. Uh, yet this border is somehow uh, penetratable. 
because sometimes we have smuggling of weapons into the Judean Samaria. Uh, we actually saw one of the parliament members of Jordan who tried to smuggle hundreds of pieces of, of weapons, uh, mostly uh, pistols, to, to whoever in, in, in Judean Samaria. And um, yes, these borders are not uh, sealed 100%, yet behind these borders, there is a peaceful state. What, I, what I'm claiming is that as peaceful as Jordan can be, uh, Jordan cannot resist uh, or might not even uh, willing to resist an invasion of uh, foreign four cars like um, um, lines and, and convoys of uh, foreign four uh, uh, vehicles like Toyota uh, um, pickup cars with you know fighters and with weapons and with ammunition and all these things. And uh, Jordan might say, yeah, okay, we cannot resist them, we cannot fight them. They are going around with RPG, they will kill us, they will bomb us. So we refrain from messing with them and they can uh, have an open, an open road to Israel. Look, all the way from the point at which they invade Jordan, all the way to Israel, it will take them, what, two hours maybe, two hours, three hours, you know what, four hours. If Israel is not aware of it, they will uh, be on the Israeli border in, in no time. Okay, so a four-hour window of time for these Iranian militias to overtake the Jordanian each army, reach the border of Israel. Do we know the, the capacity of these militias, how large they are, how well they're armed, let's say in comparison to Hamas or Hezbollah? There are thousands of people. They're trained, equipped, they have drones, they have missiles, they have vehicles, they have weapons. Uh, Iran definitely invested a lot in preparing these uh, militias to, first of all, it started with the fight against ISIS already like uh, eight years ago. Uh, but they are there, they are there in order to stay there. And uh, they, uh, are, they might, uh, you know, get the idea to invade Jordan or to pass through Jordan uh, all the way to Israel and not in order to fight Jordan but in order to fight Israel and to invade Israel as Hamas did on October 7th in the morning. Now in terms of kind of the, the playbook of Iran, Hamas was the first uh, force to attack Israel what would cause Iran to suggest to, you know, to push Hezbollah versus these militias through Jordan? Is one a priority for the, than the other? No, no. Originally, Hamas were not supposed to open a war by themselves. They should have waited to Hezbollah, to the militias in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen as well. They should have all waited until they all get um, an order from Iran to start an all-out war an all-out war from all the fronts together in order to bring Israel to its knees within two or three days. This was the satanic, diabolic uh, Iranian plan. Hamas were not supposed to start a war by themselves. And actually, Iran and Hezbollah and all the others were very much surprised uh, to, to, to hear that uh, Hamas actually opened the war, a, a war against Israel. It, it, it was not supposed to be. And actually, and now when everybody is talking about the multi-front war which Iran prepared, I wrote about this last April, like 10 months ago, but uh, it was not, let's say, in a high, uh, in a high place in the uh, public awareness here in Israel, unfortunately. But uh, um, uh, Hamas were not supposed to start a war because it actually, they actually destroyed the Iranian plan because now everybody is talking about this. Uh, the IDF is re recruited. Uh, some of them is, are in the north, preventing a similar uh, war in the in the in in in, in the north. And Israel evacuated uh, many thousands of uh, residents from the north in order not to be killed and and uh, kidnapped by Radwan force uh, from Lebanon. So and they, what Hamas actually did is they destroyed the Iranian plan. 
Uh, but now, already four months, and Iran and its allies are asking themselves, okay, what are we doing? Do we let Israel um, to eradicate Hamas altogether and thus be viewed as traitors after we equip them, after we armed them, after we trained uh, Hamas? Now we are abandoning them? No way. So, uh, uh, and so what, what you see from Lebanon, what you see from Yemen, the missiles, and the drones which are coming from them are all meant to show that these countries are also at war with Israel, although not an all-out war as Hezbollah can wage against Israel with its 150 more or less thousand of uh, missiles, many of them precise. They didn't uh, use this uh, stockpile of uh, weapons yet, uh, but the, the, the question is, what will happen as of today? Because today, as you might know, uh, Hezbollah actually attacked uh, three uh, army bases in the north, causing casualties. And uh, now the question is, what Israel is doing? Does Israel broaden the war against Hezbollah or Israel contains what happened today and continues and, you know, to have border clashes with uh, Hezbollah uh, as it was for the last four months. Okay, I want to ask you a question on, on that issue of Hezbollah. But before that, just to go back to what you said about Hamas, that they jumped the gun, and they didn't coordinate their attack. Clearly, they were planning this attack for many, many years. Why would they have broken with protocol, so to speak, and not worked with their Arab neighbors to attack all at once? What was in it for them? Because they were very much worried about the advancement of the um, negotiations between Israel and Saudi Arabia about normalization. They were ma very much afraid that the timetable of Saudi Arabia to normalize relations with Israel is actually coordinated with the Americans who want to have this peace signed on the loan of the White House uh, more or less in June this year uh, towards the general election, or the presidential elections in the United States. Uh, the, uh, Hamas suspected that Iran will not start the war, the big war against Israel until June, uh, because as long as Biden is in the administration, the Iranians try to make the best out of it. So, uh, and, and don't forget that Iran will not start such a thing against Israel as long as Iran doesn't uh, has not yet acquired nuclear weapons. So the timetable of Hamas were much more hasty uh, compared to the one of the Iranians. Therefore, they, they actually planned to start it already last uh, April in Leila Seder, in the eve, the first evening of Pesach, Passover last, last year. Uh, but Israel discovered it, and they postponed it because of this. And they moved it to the Hagim, to the high holidays uh, of uh, October. And uh, they looked for an opportunity and they found uh, on, on October 7th when they could capture many more Israelis who took part in this uh, uh, party, which was uh, the Nova party uh, near Kibbutz Rahim. And they actually timed it to the morning, early morning, so the kids cannot run away uh, in the darkness. So they planned it very well. Israel uh, was too much uh, uh, felt secure, uh, although they were planning. Unfortunately, the Israeli intelligence did not uh, have any indication about uh, this attack. And the indications which were uh, already were not in interpreted in the right way. So uh, we were surprised yet. They are much. They have much bigger surprise because uh, Hamas expected that if they capture like 250 Israeli hostages, Israel will never dare to invade Gaza. However, Israel uh, did it and uh, destroy. I am more than sure that if Sinwar knew that the results of October 7 will be what Gaza looks like today, he wouldn't do it in thousand years. Now, Dr. Kidar, you are an expert on Arab society. So what you're suggesting is that Hamas had the independence, the wherewithal to break from Iran, so to speak, 
To what extent uh, does that have implications in the Arab world? And to what extent potentially could Nasrallah or Hezbollah make a decision independent of their instruction from Iran? Well, you can roughly compare it to the relations between Israel and the United States of America. Although the United States is helping Israel, supporting Israel, supplying with all, with almost everything which we need, yet Israel has the large margin of uh, decisions which Israel can take by itself, although the Americans are not that satisfied about this. So uh, I, I think that there is a parallel situation between Iran and the, and the others, of course, not to, to go out for war with Israel, but uh, yet uh, they do feel that they have some kind of, of uh, freedom to do things without consulting the Iranians. By the way, Hezbollah is the same. Hezbollah is the same. Okay, so let's go back now to Hezbollah. Do you think that it's in Israel's best interest to engage in all-out war with Hezbollah right now or to wait for some potential diplomatic solution to come about? Well, this question should be directed to the Israeli government. I have no idea what they plan. I don't know what is the formation which they own uh, in order to make decisions in this. And I have absolutely no idea about the international pressures to do or not to do anything with Hezbollah. So uh, this question, I really, I, I, I'm not able to, to answer because I have no idea what happens in Jerusalem uh, in the decision-making circles. Very fair, very fair. Let's let's go back I to- I don't know, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't have the information, so how, how can I uh, know what to say? Absolutely. Okay, let's go back to, to Gaza if we can. And you've spoken a lot about your day after suggestions, I believe, in terms of clans um, uh, ruling over Gaza. Can you share that with our audience? Well, in the Middle East, uh, the states actually are divided roughly to two kinds of states, failing states and successful states. The failing states are Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Sudan, uh, Libya and maybe Algeria as well. Why the success successful countries are Kuwait, Qatar, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, five more united with Dubai and Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, uh, Oman and Saudi Arabia. Um, when you ask questions, what makes the difference between the successful and, and the failing states? People will tell you that the oil in the Gulf is the is the reason. But it is wrong because Iraq has a lot of oil and Iraq is a um, mayhem. Um, Libya has a lot of oil and Libya is a swamp of blood, tears and fire. Why Dubai without oil and without uh, um, uh, gas is, is a heaven on earth. So how can you explain it? It's, it's, not, it's not so evident it's not the oil. The, the answer is the makeup of the society. In all the failing countries, the society is comprised of various groups, uh, ethnic groups like Arabs, uh, Kurds, uh, Turkmens, Berbers in North Africa, uh, tribes or clans, uh, religions like Muslims, Christians, uh, Alawis, Druze, and so forth, and, uh, and sects like Sunnah, Shia, and all kinds of denominations within, this, within the Christian uh, home. And, the, and the, the, the societies in these countries are not galvanized, are f highly fragmented, and this is why these countries are failing states. Why? The Gulf Emirates and the Gulf, the Kuwait, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, and Oman, uh, each and every one was based on the clan, one clan usually. Um, Kuwait is the, the name of the clan which owns Kuwait, is Al Sabah. Al is a clan. Uh, Qatar is Al Thani, Abu Dhabi is Al Nihyan, uh, Dubai is Al Maktoum, and Saudi Arabia, lo and behold, are Al Saud. Uh, means when you base a country, a state, on a clan, it is stable, a stable country, uh, life on, is normal, uh, economy flourishes with oil or without oil, people are not fighting each other. And the state is normal state, only because it is homogeneous. 
while the, while the heterogeneous countries are failing states. As a result, what I recommend to the Israeli decision makers is to emulate the clan system means to establish clan emirates in Judea and Samaria, in the cities of Judea, Judea and Samaria, and Gaza as well. Because this is the only thing which works very well in the, in the in Middle East. M meaning, a uh, uh, an emirate in Hebron for the clans of Hebron, another one in Jericho for the, the Arikat clan, which lives in Jericho, another one in Ramallah for the Barghutis, which are the main clan of Ramallah and its vicinities, uh, another one in Tulkaren for the Karmis, um, in, in Nablus as well, and Jenin and Kalkilia, and in Gaza, to divide Gaza to five emirates, according to the administrative division of, uh, of Gaza, uh, from the north to the south, Betlaya, Beit Hanun, the second one is Gaza, the city, the third is Dir al Balach, the fourth is Khan Yunus, and the fifth in the south is Rafia, Rafa. And according, and the government should be delegated to the clans, not to Hamas and not to the PA, which proved its failure in Judea and Samaria. And this is the only thing which works well in the Middle East. Clans usually are trying to achieve stability, good economy, good life, stable life. And this is why they don't look for enemies to galvanize their ranks. As it is, in countries like Syria, Iraq, Libya, Sudan, Yemen, and Lebanon. And this is actually what I suggest. Unfortunately, Westerners like Israelis, Europeans, and especially Americans, they do not understand this idea because they think from American or Western uh, mindset according to their set of values and set of priorities and they think that democracy can occur in the Middle East, although there is not even one real democratic country all over the Islamic and the Arab world. Okay, so this is what they advocate, a, a democratic country, although they don't realize that there is not even one of those democratic countries in the Arab the Islamic world. This is why this idea is something which cannot work in the Middle East. Only Emirates work well and just look at the Gulf to see how well this paradigm works. And this is what I recommend to Gaza and Judea and Samaria as well. Israel should stay in, Gaza, in Judea and Samaria. Israel should stay forever in the rural areas in order and, uh, to suggest or to offer Israeli citizenship to the villagers in order uh, to secure uh, uh, or to ensure Israeli Israel's uh, security. And this is how we can bridge between their freedom, you know, because this way uh, Israel actually leaves 85% of the population of uh, Judea and Samaria to have their own emirates and they can be citizens in their in their own emirates. And this way is the, this way is the best way how to achieve peace and stability between us and, and the Palestinians. No Hamas, no Abbas, only the clans. The, the ideological radicalization and the Jew hatred that we see in Gaza, that we see in Judea and Samaria, how does that translate into these emirates um, countries? The countries that have these emirates, these clans, is there a, more of a favorable view of Jews? And uh, the ones that, that don't have this system, is that what breeds that that hatred? How, what's the correlation there? The hatred against Israel was the way how to galvanize the groups under the illegal and immoral and illegitimate ages of the PA. The PA actually tried to create a legitimacy to itself by Jew hatred and by using Israel as the enemy because they have no hold to the, to the population, because the people are much more loyal to the clan rather than being loyal to the PA. And the PA, don't forget, was created by sin with the Israelis. And whatever is being born by sin cannot be legitimized ever 
in this region. Okay? So this is why the PA is, is illegitimate. Therefore, they are trying to create legitimacy by Jew hatred, uh, hatred to Israel, and all you, all you see in the public sphere in the PA. The clans are legitimate. They don't need an external enemy. They don't look for external enemy, and they will not try to turn Israel into the enemy because they don't need an enemy. They have their own uh, uh, legitimacy because this is how it works in the Middle East. So looking at, at cities like uh, Hebron and, and Yericho and, and Janine, are there clans already in those locations who in theory, if the PA were to topple, could be able to step up and govern those cities? This, this, is, the, this is the population of, the, of these cities. Although Janine is a bit different. Janine only. Uh, the, the history of Janine is different. Because Jenin actually was a, was a very small village uh, where refugees from Israel ran away in 1948, settled in this village, and the city actually grew around the refugee camp, which is in the center of the city. While in all the other cities, in Tulkarem, Kalkilia, uh, uh, Nablus, Ramallah, Jericho, and Hebron, the Refugee camps are outside from the city, some of them closer to the city, like Balata, Askar, Jilazun, near, near uh, uh, Nablus, while others kick the refugees far, like Hebron, uh, who made sure that there are no less than 12 kilometers between Hebron and the refugee camp because of cultural issues. So uh, this is what, what happened there. And uh, definitely the clans are there for many, many centuries, for centuries, if not uh, decades. And definitely we can rely on them. Of course, we have to keep uh, an, an open eye, an open ear uh, in order to hear and see what happens, what happens there. But definitely they are way much more reliable uh, from the Israeli point of view uh, than compared to the PA and of course, comments. Dr. Kidar, thank you so much for entertaining all my questions. We have one minute left, so let me ask but one no, final. Let me, let me suggest to you and to your viewers, please go to Google and Google Palestinian Emirates or Emirates Solution. Palestinian Emirates Solution. You'll find much material, you'll find clips, you'll find text about this, you can read. And uh, if anyone has questions about this, please contact me by email, which is kedar, K-E-D-A-R, at newsrael.com. Newsrael, N-E-W-S-R-A-E-L.com. Please write to me, and I'll try, I'll do my best to answer every question. Dr. Kedar, thank you so much for that. We put um, your email in the chat, so anyone who's looking at the chat uh, has access and can send their questions to you. This was a fascinating, enlightening conversation. Thank you so much for joining. I hope you'll come back and uh, enlighten us further. Thank you, of course, to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning into this briefing. We will be back with you 10 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. Until then, stay safe, stay strong, take care, everyone. Thank you so much.